You can't overestimate the power of a father, Ephesians 6, 4. You know, I shouldn't be preaching today. I'm still on vacation technically. But when we tried to find a couple of weeks where I could possibly be away, it fell on these two Sundays. I'm so grateful for uh, the Val Alvarez family and their great ministry last Sunday. Here was a great uh, ministry presentation. I wasn't there. I was at Bedside Baptist. They don't understand. <laughs> I was asleep anyway. <laughs> but about a month ago when I saw the schedule that I would be probably going on Father's Day, I decided, no, this day is so important, so vital, that we can't overestimate the power of Father, that I wanted to be here this day to emphasize how important you are, fathers, to your families, to your church, to our community. We can't over oversize it. So uh, as I had this title uh, planned, it was in response to my Mother's Day message, you can't underestimate the value of a mother. So all I'm about to say is, you know, without mom, <laughs> you're partners, but I'm going to talk about fathers today. You can't underestimate the value of a mom, you know, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Ruth, and Hannah, and let's see, who else? There's many other women in the Bible that are worthy of great praise, and so the proverb says their children will rise up and call them blessed. But today, I want to focus on the importance of a father. I chose this title to say you can't overestimate it, but my son came over. He lives right behind us, or I, we live right behind them, just a gate between us and our backyards. And I was saying, so David, he's about 43. We're going to be talking about this on Sunday, and I've got this title. And he says, Dad, I've got this new app. It's called uh, Artificial Intelligence. He said, really? I've heard about that, and I'm afraid of it. He says, well, you know, you can ask this app anything, and it'll come up with answers just like that. I said, okay. Have them come up with a title for Ephesians 6.4. You can't overestimate the power of Father. So here's some that came up. There are five of them in 10 seconds. I mean, why do I need to study, right? <laughs> Fatherhood, colon, nurturing hearts, shaping destinies, lessons from Ephesians 6.4. Man, that's good. From a machine. Okay, here's a second one. Building strong foundations a father's role according to Ephesians 6.4. I'm feeling kind of obsolete by now. The third one, the father's calling, guiding with love and discipline, insights from Ephesians 6.4. <laughs> Another one, the fourth one, a father's legacy, leaving an imprint of faith, reflections on Ephesians 6.4. Folks, I'm just going to call it in, all right? <laughs> and the fifth one, fathers as role models, embracing the responsibility, exploring Ephesians 6.4. Those are all good. Even though they're machine generated in 10 seconds, my brain couldn't even read them that fast. Okay. But none of those came close to what Billy Graham said years ago. He said, quote, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. Right? Now, he's got to turn on this. It's not a machine generated. It's biblically generated from what the Scripture says. And as I've been studying and thinking about this, I read an article uh, June 4th in Fox News by J.P. Degantz, and he writes that evangelists must foster healthy, Christ-centered marriages for a faith revival to take root in our country. He goes to the Christian home. That's where revival takes place, but then it goes on more as you read. And I quote this, you see, the flight of resident fatherhood from the home over the past 60 years, according to Communio's nationwide study on faith and relationships, may offer the best explanation for the collapse of Christianity in the United States 
over much of the last 40 years. That is sobering, isn't it? Seems like churches for women, not for men. The decorations are for women, not for men. It's a woman's thing, but not according to the Scripture said. What does the Bible say? Open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians 6, 4. And this is a letter to the church at Ephesus, to all those Christians there, and this is the summary and finalization of applying the doctrine of the first three chapters of Ephesians to practical daily living, and specifically in chapter 6, verse 4, after Paul has addressed all of us to be filled with the Spirit, he addresses husbands and wives, children, then fathers, then slaves, and masters. Everyone has a unique role in how we relate to God and how that's to play out in our lives and the roles that we have. And it says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's what the New International Version says. Exasperate. I have to pronounce that word several times to get it right. But as I look at this one verse, I see three things I want us to take away today and apply to our lives. Number one, Embrace the Father's power. Write that down in your message notes. The Father's power online as well. There is a power in being a father. Now you notice that this is quite specific. It doesn't say fathers and mothers. It's fathers. The male gender. Now I'm getting into politics. No, politics is getting into the word. And what does the Bible say? It says fathers and yes, there are single moms out there. May God bless you and increase and help you and strengthen you and send into your kids' lives godly men to help you. But fathers, in God's design, this is what this is addressed to, and then who will be fathers. Now, when I'm talking about this, although I've been married almost 56 years and had kids 47 years, I am not an expert. I'm like one beggar sharing bread with another beggar. I'm reading into God's Word and saying, these are the things that I'm trying to apply in my life. And uh, you can look at our kids and our grandkids and see how they turn out. Although they're their own people, they make their own choices. There's a responsibility that a father has and how their children turn out. But when Paul wrote to the Ephesian church in that day and age, fathers in Rome, under Roman law, had absolute power over their kids. When a baby was born in a Roman family, it was brought out and laid before the father. If he picked up the child, it meant he was accepting that child into his house. But if he did not pick it up, it meant the child was rejected. It could be sold, given away, or even killed by exposure. That's an awesome power of a father. Life and death, security, insecurity, abuse, or care. And the Word of God cuts right through culture and says this is how a father is to deal with their children in a loving, heavenly, God, heavenly father way. We are to use our authority as fathers not to abuse our children, but to encourage them and build them up. Now, as I look at the Scriptures, and if you find one that can help me with this, I don't see anywhere in the Bible, that the, that the primary spiritual training of children is assigned to anyone else but to the father. It's not assigned to mothers, and it's certainly not assigned to the state or the government, is it? No. <laughs> or to schools or unions and all that kind of stuff. It's only assigned to the, the father in the house. Laser-focused, specific, Politically incorrect. I could go to jail for saying this. It could be judged as hate speech by some people. But the Bible says it is the father who is responsible for their children's spiritual upbringing and nourishment. The father is to be the leader in the home. Period. Scripture says that very clearly. But as I look at this, uh, as I say, this is a heavy responsibility. And when I realize you're going to have kids, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm, this is hard. 
And I'm so grateful when I was still in seminary, I mean seminary, at Dallas Theological Seminary, I took a class by Dr. Howard Hendricks on, you know, the Christian family and home. And we spent a whole semester under his tutelage and training on looking at scriptures and looking at ways to inculcate biblical values in your children and in your family and your home. And I'm telling you, that was a lifesaver for me because that started before I even had a kid. We took out many of our craziness on our first dog, our dachshund. He was totally spoiled rotten. We mistreated him. So we got all that out of the system. So when our daughter was born, we didn't have to treat her like we did our first dog. Anyway, <laughs> just saying. This is a hard thing to talk about, but it is so important that maybe men don't realize it, but fathers must be present, available, focused, loving, caring, priority given to your children more than your work or anything else. Of first importance, let me say this, fatherhood is for males only. It is for males to be men, biblical men. Now, is this Paul, who probably wasn't married, venting some Judaic, some kind of tradition? No. This comes right out of the Old Testament. If you look in the context of Ephesians, look at verse uh, 31, quoting the Old Testament. For this reason, a man, physical, biological man, will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The problem is, in America, our culture is drifting apart because we don't believe Genesis chapter 1, that God is the creator. We believe these truths to be self-evident, that the creator, who's he? You know, that's where it is now. But the Bible makes it very clear this is not some cultural issue. This goes right to the very beginning of God's design and intention for when he created man, a male and female, to be married, to have children, and to raise them up in a godly way. Oh, let us embrace the Father's power, the power to be a man. I'm talking about a man with substance, a man who accepts responsibility, who rejects passivity, who leads courageously, who expects God's reward by living that way. That's what a man does, rejects passivity. In other words, Adam the most passive husband, first husband ever lived. When Eve was being tempted, he was there with hands in his pocket. Oh, he didn't have clothes. He stood beside Eve as she was being tempted. Why didn't he step in and stop that and kill the snake? Well, that apple looks pretty good. Let's see if she dies. If she doesn't die, then I'll have part of the apple. A real man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility for the family, kills the snake, and things would have been a lot different. Thank you, Adam, for your bad example. The power to be a man, and again, I want to go back to this point because culture wants to cancel these very words I'm speaking online and right now from God's Word. That's why they, don't, they want to ban the Bible. Jesus said, in Matthew 19, 4 and 5, haven't you read, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? Genesis 1, And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Genesis 2, 24. My friends, the Bible is literally true. It is not something that you evolve and bend to your will. It changes us. It's living and active. And Jesus is the source. And Jesus, whom Colossians 3, 2 says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, that resurrected Jesus tells us there are just two genders, binary, male and female. In fact, if you look at Languages, Hebrew Bible, two genders. Greek New Testament, male and female, very clear. 
even uh, Spanish, feminine and masculine, La Nina, El Nino, and on and on. And the French the same way. There's a masculine, there's that going on there that there is no confusion in the Bible about if you're a man or a woman. God gave you that physical identity before you were even born. In the womb, it says in, one, in Psalm 139, He created you that way. Now, yes, we need to deal with feelings and emotions and culture and so forth, but it is not that you're born confused about your gender. It's very clear. Fatherhood is for males to be men and not just the biological father. The Bible calls men to be fathers who embrace the Father's power, the Holy Spirit. Embrace the Father's power, the power to be the man of God. And this is where men, as Christians, we have a great resource. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. When you ask Jesus to come into your life, He came into your heart. He came to make Himself at home in your life. And the Father as well, that you, he, they might be at home in your life. He says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. And the Holy Spirit has come to live, to remain. That's the word home, to make His home in you. In fact, as I quoted the vision that we have, by 2026, we see our church enthused. Enthused by the Holy Spirit, that you understand the relationship you have with God living inside of you, your body, the temple of God, the Holy Spirit not to be grieved, the Holy Spirit not to, to be quenched, the Holy Spirit, you are to walk in the Holy Spirit as He guides you into all truth. That connection with the Holy Spirit, I spent all last year after Pentecost, after Easter through Pentecost, talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit to help you understand, my friends, if your relationship with God is not in the inner person whole, and holy, and is grieved by unconfessed sin, and is quenched by disobedience to his commands, my friends, you're not getting his power to be his witness. Nothing's changed. The Bible says, as you look at the context of Ephesians again, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. What controls your life? Alcohol? Drugs? What addictions control your life? There's only one source of control that is going to bring you to wholeness, and that's the Holy Spirit who has full access. Like water pours to the deepest level, you need to open up every compartment of your life and let a spirit flood into your every being, your every compartment, your every thought, so that He teaches you and guides you and empowers you to be the man of God He's called you to be as a father. The biblical father is the tip of the spear for his child to grow up in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. The very tip, the point. Where is the father who loves God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength and all of his might and shows that to his children by the way he lives and how he talks? Now, Eli was a priest in Israel. He's the one that blessed Hannah, and Hannah had a son named Samuel. You know the story? And Hannah says, I will dedicate my son Samuel to grow up under your tutelage and in in the temple for all of his life. And so Samuel grew up. And what did Samuel see? He saw that Eli was a devoted priest, but a defective parent. Oh, he could be a priest, but he did not discipline his two sons, Hophniah and Phinehas, who stole from the sacred offerings, who had sex with the women in the back, whatever that meant. And the father, Eli, knew about it, but didn't correct them. Oh, he said, oh, you should stop it. But God held Eli accountable for his son's behavior in the church. Now, you think Samuel would get the point, right? Watching this go on, Eli with his two sons, Well, you know why they wanted a king? Israel wanted a king? Well, Samuel had two sons who would be the next prophets, but we read in in Samuel, I can find it here for you, 
that in 1 Samuel 1, 8, 3, 1 Samuel 8, 3, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So even Samuel, who was such a great priest, was an effective parent. He did not instill into his own sons who were to be the next leaders of Israel enough confidence and integrity in them that the nation says, we want a king instead of those two boys. That written in Scripture tells me that God holds the father accountable to teach their kids biblical behavior and truth, does it not? The father, our heavenly father, gives us power to teach us as fathers to be spirit-filled to have his wisdom and grace to love our kids and to give them every opportunity and encouragement to follow the Lord. But you know what? When I was growing up, I was not a robot. They could feed Scripture to my brain, but I had a free will. And kids have free wills. And you can give them the best environment possible, but they're going to make their own choices. They are not computer programs where you put a chip in, you know. These are people. But we must give them at least a picture of what it looks like to have a healthy home, to see the father kiss his wife every day at night, to see them care for each other, to see how they argue sometimes, to see the security of that home. Men take the lead. Men learn to say, I'm sorry, need to say, not your mother and I love you, say to your kid, I love you, I, your dad, love you, take the lead. He holds us accountable. Now, kids, they see an event, and we, by our life experiences, interpret it one way, and they interpret it through their lack of life experience, and they see that something that was not that problem becomes a deep wound to them. Unless we are on it, we will, have, we will let them live with that deep wound and never help them understand what really was going on. You know what I'm saying? We need to be aware and present and listening and watching and helping and not condemning, but to hold them to, to close to our hearts. The point is, in this message, we can't overestimate the power of a father. The power to help or the power to hurt. The power to heal or the power to hinder. That's what a father's role is. Oh my goodness. And as I read on in Ephesians 4, I see that we have such an important impact on our kids that our influence goes a long ways to either burdening them or blessing them. Burdening them with anger or blessing them with shalom, with wholeness. What do you want your kids to know and to be? You want them scholarships for college, a football or baseball scholarship, or would you rather have them be a person who's invested in knowing the Word of God and living it and being a hero in the body of Christ? Would you like them to have good jobs and mates, or would you like them to have Christ mind? We need fathers to set the example. Fathers, we need the fullness of the Spirit to do this so that we can help our kids, even our own failures. But let's talk about the power of the Father. Write this down. When a father is spirit-filled, he rejects the Father's power to enrage. Write that down. I chose the word. The NIV has it wrong. It's, it, they have the word exasperate. And I had to look that up. What does exa- did I pronounce it right? First of all, exasperate. Latin to out and parate to rough to make rough is to roughen the surface, and it came and to irritate to a high degree so that the kids are rough, and to to provoke to rage to vex to inflame to to chafe, to bring to cause them to be intensified to a state of annoyance and maybe to embitter. That's what the Latin word means. But this word that's used here in the Bible is the word that God, wrath. Don't provoke your kids to wrath, anger. Wow. Rage. To enrage them. Now, that sounds overstated, but we'll get to that in just a moment. In other words, fathers, let's not wear our kids out 
that they lose heart. That's what happens to a child growing up in a fatherless home, a father who may be there presently but not present in their life. The absent father wound is deep. They lose heart with life. They don't feel they're any good. They don't like what, what's going on anywhere. They become cynical. They, they, they turn in on themselves, and, and that makes them mad, angry. It takes away the spirit out of them, anger and pain. What gets a child angry at their dad's? Well, dad, you didn't come to the game. Dad, you didn't play pitch with me. You know, that old metaphor. You weren't there just to be with me, to chill together, to play with me, to listen to me, to hear my heart. Where were you? You're working 40 hours a day? The Bible holds you accountable for your children that they know that you're there for them and with them. Now, one thing I learned and tried to practice from that class I had in seminary was, I think it's common now, but back then in the dark ages before the earth's crust was formed and our kids were young, was a daddy date. And so once a week as a pastor, I said to our daughter Mary Margaret, every day, at the, every week at this, on this day at this time, I will be here to take you out for a date so you can do whatever you want to do within reason. And at four and five, that was okay. But when she became 12 and she liked clothes, I can remember going to the shopping mall. And like a butterfly, from store to store, from rack to rack, flying around, tasting each piece of clothes, I'm being the good dad. Such a martyr. But no, but so afterwards, we go down to the food court and have something to eat, and maybe, just maybe, out of that, out of that quantity time, there would just be a, a brief moment where she'd ask me something personal about her life or about me, and we could have a personal discussion. Did the same thing with our son. I wanted to teach him how to fish. So when he was old enough to walk, I took him up, to, up the Ojai to the Sespe to catch trout that were planted the day before, and I was having so much fun, and Dave was going, dirty fish. You should see that guy now. He cannot fish me any day of the week. But he had to say to me at one point, Dad, I know I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I don't, I don't like to fish. So he went skateboarding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he did great with that, except for his knees. I owe them each a dollar, each kid, whenever I use them. But that's the illustration. So I did it. And same with Judy, my wife. We had a Friday night date night. Still do. That's our Sabbath. That's our date night for 56 years, to romance, to be present, not to, to put my phone away. We have a rule that we sit down at the table, no electronics, no newspapers, no phones, don't answer it. We're here to look at each other, listen to one another. And that was work. I remember I trying to teach some content about the scriptures. We were reading Pilgrim's Progress, and my little son was down under the table. I don't know what he was doing down there, but he wasn't listening to Pilgrim's Progress. But that's what you do. But to, to, to say that we have the power to enrage our children, that's what the Bible says, but you want some other support for that? Psychology Today has an article about why children get angry, enraged. The causes of lifelong anger that some hold against a parent could be due to any one of the following. Physical, emotional neglect from parents. They may not be intentionally abusive, but were affected by their own vulnerabilities or limited emotional capacity. Physical, mental, or sexual abuse. The lack of attention, affirmation, reassurance to make a child feel worthy or unwanted, even wanted. Parents expected too much from a child or are excessively controlling. The family scapegoated a child, the emotionally sensitive child, as the problematic one. Parents were continually critical of a child. How can you break free from such as the shackles of troubling emotional past, especially when it triggers a still part of, the, of your parents' life? Does any of this sound familiar to ask? So what is the first thing you do? Acknowledge your, guess what the word is? Anger. And you want to go and ask men in prison about where their fathers were when they were growing up? 
You want to see young women who are looking for daddy in their sexual relationships before marriage? What their relationship is with the daddy? And on and on and on you can see the father's power to enrage is acted out in the most unhealthy, unwholesome ways. Reject that power. You have a greater power. The Holy Spirit is in you. Welcome the Spirit, the, the Father's power to nourish. Look at it goes on in Ephesians 6, 4. Instead, in fact, that word is the strongest word for but. You can put B-U-T, but. Stop that. Start this. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord, dads. This is the dad's leadership responsibility. And how we try to delegate it to our wives and our mothers or to our grandparents or to the schools or to the churches. And yes, schools and churches and moms certainly are needed. But the father is the point. The father is the tip of the spear. The father is the one who shows true humility and what that looks like when you learn to say, I'm sorry. And you don't treat your kids with harshness and, and rules and, and whatever it is, but you love them as Jesus did. The word nourish comes from the word here. It says bring them up. It's actually the word nourish. It means to feed. What's on your menu, fathers, for your kids today in the Word of God? It's wonderful to wake up and find in your menu as a father who loves you and cares for you and is available to you and puts you before work. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Bring them up. It's the same word used in Ephesians 5.29 about husbands nourishing their wives. The father, Christian fathers, to nourish his children by sharing his love and encouragement in the Lord. You know, it's the word nourish means yes, to feed them, house them, but it doesn't mean to buy them a brand new Mustang or even a car. It means to meet their physical needs and balance their lives so that they're not living a worldly life of materialism, but their greatest value is to please the Lord instead of their peers. Jesus tells us that you can use this power to nourish. You know how. He said in Matthew 7, 9 through 11, which of you, if your son asks for bread, gives him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Oh, we have a good, good Father. He wants to give you his wisdom. He wants to give you his power. He wants to give you biblical examples. He wants to arrange your life and schedule that you see as you, this is the path, walk in it, to be the godly father he has called you to be. Oh, that that would happen in our churches all across America. There would be a national revival, and they wouldn't go to a Dodger game where they mock Christianity. They wouldn't drink Bud Light and all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Where's your voice, men? Where's your money go, men? What do your kids say? They know what, they hear what you say, but how do you spend your money? Let them know. Show them how to do a budget. Bring them up so that they are emotionally, spiritually healthy. As Jesus grew up, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. What a Great example, Luke 2.52. Here's balanced growth, intellectual, physical, spiritual growth. Well, that's why I say shalom to you when I greet you. That's what I'm asking God to give you, that shalom, that balance, that integrity, that wholeness of life, which is sweet, which is Christ-like, which is joyful, even in the hard, rough times. Bring them up. How do we do that? Number one, train by godly example. Now, the word godly is underlined, but the word example is underscored. You will leave in your child what you've lived out in your home more than what you say. This kind of behavior is more caught than taught. Yes, use words, please do. When a father implores and exhorts his children, with his convictions of what biblical, with love, the child sees those convictions if they're really lived out or is this hypocritical talk, happy talk. When these convictions are modeled by you, 
and, and, the, and they see that you really mean what you're saying, what you're building into their lives is you're integrating the word into their lives, and that's the word integrity, solidness. Not wimpy, solid. The Lord disciplines those he loves, and so we are to discipline our kids. And some people, oh my goodness, now he's going to talk about beating your kids. Well, the Bible says, he who spares the rod hates his, his son, but he who loves him with careful discipline. doesn't mean you discipline your child in anger, but discipline is a sign that you love him. You care enough, Eli, to stop Hophni and Phinehas from what they're doing. You love them, Samuel, to stop Ab uh, Abijah and Joel from what they're doing. You intervene. You counsel them. You help them. You discipline those you love. If you love them, spend time with them and take the time. Even though you're worn out and tired from a long day's work, you have to stop and say, give me the strength, Lord, to do this and to do it well. And you don't discipline while you're being angry either or tired. Our pediatrician, when our kids are first young, says, now, when Judy, when Mike gets home, I want you to greet him at the door with a glass of orange juice and send him upstairs for five minutes before he talks to anybody. Why? Does he know me? Yeah, I get home and I'm tired. I need my sugar level up. I'm worn out. What are you doing? Wait, you know, we call that the pit between four and six. Before When you get off from work and you eat dinner, that's the time you don't want to talk about bad issues or hard things. You got to be physically regenerized, spiritually. You know, I've got to change gears. One thing that I was taught is that when I left work in Ventura, I can remember driving. It was about a five-mile drive. There was a part on Romelli and Telegraph, a strawberry field, and that's where I would stop thinking about church and leave it there. You wonder what that pile was in the strawberry field. There it is. And I would start praying and thinking about, now what is David doing today? What is he doing? What's, what's Mary Margaret doing today? What's, what's Judy up to? So when I get home, I'd pray for them for the last 10 minutes before I get home. It's California traffic. So when I get there, I'm more programmed from not being the pastor with all this load of stuff which is important, but, you know, I'm, this is the Lord's church. He has a bride, and I, and I have mine. Train them up by a godly example. You know, King David's neglect of Absalom, what that got him? He brought him back to, you know, Absalom killed his brother for incest with his raping his sister-in-law. Sent him away, brought him back, but wouldn't talk to him for two years. Brought him back to Jerusalem. And what happened to Absalom? He became the usurper of the throne and kicked his own dad out of Jerusalem. David's neglect, his failure, his bad example with Bathsheba, all of that, and the many ways. So bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Hebrews 12 gives you an example. But I like what Paul writes, and by example, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 11 to 12, for you know that we dealt with each one of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging comforting and urging you to live godly lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. He said as the pastor, you know how I lived with you as a father. Encouraged. That's why, you know, elder is a time word. That a man has been around long enough to know how to raise his kids in a godly way. And that's what Paul talks about with the church at Thessalonica. He uses this statement about himself he says, you are witnesses, and so has God how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. You saw our convictions, just not hearing my words. You see, you give your children real direction when you live like that, a real example. You fill their souls with substance, and that makes them uh, interestingly, uh, interesting corollary there. If you don't, it'll be filled with other stuff, right? Fill it with the good stuff so they have no room for the bad stuff. Discipline consistently with love and wisdom, without anger, abuse, or favoritism. Love your kids. That sounds simple, doesn't it? No, you do that. But rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Where's a relationship? It's somewhere that we have high control in a kid's life. You should also have high support. That's what discipline is. High control high support. When you have high control and low support, you're creating rebellion because you're, all, you're a, a, a autocratic. But if you have low control and big support, 
you're pampering and spoiling your kids. But if you have low control and low support, that's neglect. And boy, that's what we're seeing raised up in our culture right now. One man named Ross Campbell, How Do We Love Your Child, says three things that you can do with your kids when you talk to them. Look at them. Put your phone down. Have them put their phone down. Eye contact. <laughs> Focused attention. And physical touch. Hug them. Love them. Set boundaries and reinforce them. Discipline without favoritism. You know, Isaac and Rebecca, boy, they did. They had the favoritism going and so forth. But what every child needs is their dad to say these three things to their kids with focused attention. David, Mary Margaret, if you're listening, it's Father's Day in front of God and everybody. I love you. And I'm proud of both of you. <laughs> and you're so good at, and I can tell you exactly what they're good at. Every child needs to hear that from the day they can understand it. You talk to your fathers. You sit down with your sons and your daughters and you say, I love you. And I'm so proud of you. And you're so good at this. I'm bringing you up in the, in the training that you're bent at. You're a great kid. I'm so pleased to be an honor with you, to know you. That's Father's Day. That's what's missing among men. You know, when I was in seminary, you're supposed to pray with your wife. I was afraid to pray out loud. And I'm learning Greek and Hebrew and theology, and I can't pray. <clears throat> Be a man, Mike. Speak up and pray out loud. Men, take the lead and be men of prayer out loud. Don't be like I was for so many years. And show them that you're reading the Bible on a regular basis. So I have a private place where I read my Bible every day. And my 10-year-old granddaughter likes to ravage our house. What are you doing in there, Grandpa? I'm reading my Bible. Why? Because I love it. Why? <laughs> I don't care. I just wanted to know that this word takes up my time, and I want you to know it's real. Show them, Grandpas. Teach your kids to do this. Serve them biblical food as a godly example. When I say nourish, that's where, in the training and instruction of the Lord, that means the Word of God, the truth, content, talk about. I was reading Ezra the other day, and I said, you know, I was reading first Ezra. Our kids are there. My son is there. That God is sovereign over the nations. You know, he moved in the heart of King Cyrus to send the Jews back to Jerusalem with all that wealth and stuff for the temple. God moved in the heart of Cyrus, the Bible says. He's sovereign God over all the kings. He lifts up kings and takes them down. I'm not preaching. I just talked out loud. That's what just oozes out when you're filled with God's word. And I'm telling you, it's taken 56 years to get to the point where something starts to ooze out. You can do better. Please do better. In fact, teach your kids Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And the promise is that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on earth. There's the promise. Teach your kids. You kids, you want to have a good life? Then it begins by proper respect of your mom and dad. On Father's Day, on Mother's Day, and not just on Father's Day and Mother's Day. Every day would be a good day to honor your parents. But do it in the lifestyle of Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and following. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you are today to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk 
Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, phylacteries, and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Your home is to be saturated with God's Word. Not a 10-minute sermon. That's just how you live. That's what normal life really looks like in a house where a man is a man of God filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask you that we would hear your word in Ephesians 6, 4 against all the chatter and cancellation culture of this world and that fathers would be encouraged by your spirit, by your wisdom, strengthened, Lord, by your own fluence thrown through them to be the men of God that their families so desperately need and want. That you'd raise up men in this church who are godly fathers and grandfathers that others who don't have parents or fathers can see here elderly men who are following the Lord that I can follow. Oh God, do that in this church. This great resource of these godly men here in this church. Send those people who need that kind of parenting as Paul gave to them. Oh Lord, send revival to our county, to our schools, to our state, to our country. And Lord, if you choose to come now, that'd be fine here, there, or in the air. But meanwhile, Lord, let us indeed follow you. We are your slaves. We are your servants. We want you to be praised as the Heavenly Father. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come.